we're going to have Duncan Wood. He's a vice president for strategy and new initiatives at the Wilson Center. He's going to kind of pick up on an emerging theme we're covering, picks up on a conversation that our own Namal Kareem had back at the last Global Mining Symposium with the World Bank around critical metals. This conversation is titled The Mosaic Approach to Boost Critical Mineral Supply. Let me introduce Namal to you all. He will be our moderator. He's a senior staff reporter with the Northern Miner. He has more than 10 years of experience in journalism, covering crucial issues for major media groups like Thomson Reuters, with reports picked by The Guardian, Al Jazeera, National Post, CBC, and The Global Mail. He focuses on stories that connect the global mining industry to climate change and just transition. Nemo, welcome back to the Global Mining Symposium. Really looking forward to this conversation. Hello, Duncan. Welcome to the Global Mining Symposium. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. All right, Nemo, I'll let you provide the proper introduction of, of, uh, of Duncan. Thank you, Anthony. And uh, hello, everyone, once again, to another uh, edition of the GMS. Uh, my guest today is uh, Mr. Duncan Wood. Uh, Duncan is the Vice President for Strategy and New Initiatives at the Wilson Center, which is a nonpartisan policy forum that tackles global issues through independent research. He's also an internationally renowned specialist on North American politics, uh, Mexico, and U.S.-Mexican ties. He has authored and edited 12 books and is currently co-chair of the World Economic Forum's uh, Global Future Council on Transparency and Anti-Corruption. He was a professor and, and the director of the International Relations Program at the Instituto Tecno uh, Tecnologico Autonomo de Mexico uh, for, in Mexico City for 17 years. Um, he received his doctorate in political studies from our very own Queen's University in Canada. Duncan regularly gives testimony to the U.S. Congress on U.S.-Mexico relations and also recently spoke about the importance of critical minerals. In fact, he also talked about the geopolitics around the demand for critical minerals in a podcast run by the Ontario Mining Association called This is Mining quite recently, the link of which is available in the box in case anyone's interested in taking a peek. Uh, Duncan, welcome. Uh, how are you and where are you joining us from? Uh, thanks for having me, Naimal. Um, doing very well. Delighted to be here. I have to say it's a great opportunity to speak to folks that uh, I don't necessarily get the opportunity to speak to always. Um, and I'm speaking to you right now from my office at the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C., right here right. in Federal Triangle, halfway between Congress and the White House. Right. Um, you recently co-authored a paper called the Mosaic Approach, where you write about the need for a multidimensional strategy between the government, private institutes, and international allies to strengthen America's critical mineral supply chain. Um, so, you know, how would you rate America's current position compared to its competitors in the mining sector currently? And what are the changes it faces? What, what are the challenges it faces? Sorry. Thanks. So let me just tell you a little bit about the work that we're doing at the Wilson Center on Critical Minerals right now, but a number of different projects um, uh, it really all began uh, a few years ago when our Latin America program began to look at um, the lithium triangle down in uh, the southern cone and began to look at the strategic importance of that. We also have a uh, long term work going on at our environmental change and security program here at the Wilson Center on the environmental and ESG implications of, uh, of critical mineral mining. And then what we did about a, we began about a year ago was um, looking at the Biden administration's mm -hmm. strategic review of, uh, uh, of, of supply chains, we began to focus on critical minerals as our first um, uh, dimension of looking at US policy. And we called together uh, a significant uh, group of stakeholders, US, European, Canadian firms in the space. And we decided that rather than go what the, the same route that the government had, uh, had gone, which was really to look at critical minerals from a national security perspective, what we've done is we've called together the, um, we've called together the, uh, the companies to say, give us your on the ground, uh, you know, where the rubber hits the road kind of experience and tell us what are the challenges that you're facing and where you see this going. And that's been extraordinarily um, productive for us because it's enabled us to really get up-to-date um, information and uh, information from the experts. And so for all of those companies that are, uh, uh, that are listening to this or watching this uh, uh, symposium right now, I have to say, if you're interested in getting engaged, please to sort of just reach out and we'll be happy to have conversations with you about including you with our Critical Minerals Working Group as we move ahead. 
Now, the Mosaic approach was the publication that came out of that uh, stakeholder engagement. And uh, we, uh, it's, it's a relatively short document, only around sort of 20 pages long, 25 pages long. Um, but what it's done is it, it's a document that is written for US um, policymakers. And so it is uh, you know, necessarily a little bit simplified from the complex reality. But we put forward a series of recommendations in there, which we can talk about a little bit later on. Um, but perhaps the most important part of the document, at least at the beginning, is to say exactly where are we as a country. And in the United States, I, the first thing we have to recognize is that we are starting from a huge deficit. Ch the Chinese have a massive lead over the United States in terms of securing the critical minerals that they need for their national security um, uh, needs, as well as for the, uh, the energy transition, which is underway. And because of that, and because of the massive and rapidly growing demand that we're seeing in the sector, urgent action is needed because otherwise the United States could be shut out from the supplies that are desperately needed for the energy transition. What we're seeing right now, for example, is that, um, and the previous, the previous uh, presenter talked about the, um, the EV revolution that we're underway. You know, if the Biden administration has its way so that by 2030, half of all the new vehicles that are sold in the United States are EVs, there are simply not enough critical minerals being mined in the world today to satisfy that, let alone what happens when other countries go through that same EV revolution. So it's an urgent, it's a dramatic situation. I spoke about this recently on the This Is Mining podcast with our friend Morgan uh, Murphy, um, you know, over there. And I have to say that that was a great opportunity to reach a new audience. And, you know, if you get a chance to listen to that, please do. But it's a, a very serious situation. What's good about what's happening here and the fact that, you know, publications like ours, and there's lots of them out there now. Um, uh, the, the great thing about those publications being out there is that it's really incited a lot of interest. So we're seeing the Biden administration, as I mentioned, with its review of supply chains and critical minerals. We've seen the Biden administration um, use its uh, Defense Procurement Act recently, focus that on the, uh, on the critical mineral sector. We're also seeing congressional uh, action, not just the hearings that we've had recently, but meaningful moves to try to um, encourage, promote the mining industry here in the United States. Um, and, and just let me just give you a couple of examples of what, what we're talking about there. I mean, one is, you know, smoothing the, the permitting process. Secondly, it's about all the other things that need to happen to really promote mining from finance through to human capital, et cetera. But thirdly, I mean, one, one very simple thing is that we need to do a heck of a lot more geological surveying here in the United States. I was fascinated listening to the panels already this morning, um, you know, talking about the, uh, uh, you know, the, the analysis that's been done, the surveying that's been done in Ontario and finding out where these reserves are, we have a long way to go here in the United States. So whilst what's happening right now is really encouraging, it's horribly insufficient because, and, and, and the real danger there is that people say, well, haven't we addressed that already through the Biden administration review, the DPA, and the fact, and the fact that we're talking about legislation? This is a long-term goal of making sure that we need the critical minerals um, that we need for the energy transition, for national security concerns, but also, and I think this is one of the most important things that we often forget, it's not just the minerals that we know that we need, it's the minerals that we don't know that we'll need in the future. You know, go back 50 years and would we have thought that lithium was as important as it is today, for example, I think that's a perfect example. You know, the fact that manganese is now being considered as being a replacement for some of the cobalt that can be, you know, go into EV um, technologies. All of these things, we need to be open and we need to think about a multi-dimensional approach to this. And that's really why we talked about, why we titled the paper, The Mosaic Approach, because it's got to be lots of different factors coming together. Right, right. And I believe you also mentioned um, in your paper that the US needs to do a lot more work with its allies in this sector, uh, including Canada. Um, in, in Canada, the federal government recently announced a $3.8 billion investment in the mining sector, which was, you know, the largest of its kind. What do you think the two countries need to do more of in order to improve the sector? 
So I, I think that, uh, you know, the first step actually, I think really is here in Washington, which is that we need to have a more clearly defined strategy, which we don't have at this point in time. We have kind of a piecemeal approach. Secondly, um, the relationship with Canada is uh, hugely important. Um, you know, it's a close relationship. And on the critical minerals front, as with so much else, it's a relationship that has huge potential for mutual benefit. Um, the two countries have an action plan, a joint action plan on critical minerals, which so far has not really delivered a great deal. I think a lot more focus and effort needs to be put into that. Um, but Canada is important to the United States for so many reasons. The mining culture that uh, we all know exists in Canada, which has largely you know, been extinguished in most of the United States, not in all of the United States. Um, the mineral resources that are there that we know about and that we don't know about you know, Canada matters because if we're looking at uh, the energy transition, Canada is a huge producer of renewable energy through its hydro resources, amongst other things, which means that being able to extract these uh, critical minerals in as environmentally friendly a way as possible is going to matter in terms of the greening of the value chain. And you know, one of the things that I like to, uh, to say here is that uh, you know, we, we can talk about collaboration between Canada and the United States. Some people here in the United States talk about a Manhattan project for critical minerals. I like to think that Canada and the United States can enter into a, a highly uh, you know, mutually beneficial relationship that is really like a NORAD for the future. You know, it's working together to try to make sure that the United States and Canada have what they need. Now, in terms of what the federal government in Canada is doing, you know, 3.8 billion may sound like a lot to your average man or woman in the street, but it's a tiny amount compared to the investments that are needed. It may be important in terms of getting things going, uh, as we're seeing with the, uh, uh, with the Defense Procurement Act here in the United States. But one of the things that has really stood out for me as well this morning by listening to the presentations is the importance of going back to brownfield sites as well as greenfield sites uh, sort of you know, located right next door. And the history of mining in Canada, the fact that we have so many sites where you know, we know there are resources that either were given up on because of a lack of capital or that you know, they were not uh, uh, financially viable given the technology of the time, that's a huge opportunity to get production up and running relatively quickly. And the other thing that's very, very important, I mentioned permitting earlier on. Here in the United States, it takes between seven and 10 years to get your permits for a, uh, for a mine. That's because of a number of reasons. A complex permitting process, you know, it's really based upon the U.S. democratic model of the, you know, the federal system, the division of powers, checks and balances, etc. But also because of the litigious culture in here in the United States and and a large dose of nimbyism. Um, and I'm not saying those issues don't exist in Canada, but in order to get your per, your permit in, the, in in Canada, you know, we're looking at an average of two years. Um, compared to seven to 10 years here in the United States, which means that if we need a rapid ramping up of production, Canada really is one of the most important places to go to alongside Australia. Apply all of these factors together, look at the new tech that's available, and I think we're in a really good place. And Canada will be seen as, or is being seen as a vitally important strategic partner in terms of the critical minerals equation. Since you have plenty of experience with, with regards to Mexico as well, I think this will, this will be a good one to ask you as well. Uh, we recently saw Mexico working on nationalizing lithium. Uh, we've seen similar trades in other countries as well. Uh, going forward, do you see more and more countries taking similar steps? I mean, how do you foresee the geopolitical tension surrounding the sector? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, let's talk a little bit about the Mexican case, first of all. You know, it's the Bacanora mine in, in the state of Sonora. A uh, very impressive lithium resource, 244 million tons. Um, you know, some people say it's the largest in the world, um, uh, you know, uh, exceeding the, uh, the Thaka Pass site in, in Nevada. Um, I I'm skeptical about whether this nationalization approach will be successful in terms of producing lithium and maximizing value for the Mexican government and for um, and in terms of production of lithium for the world. Now, if they are successful, it doesn't really matter whether the resource has been nationalized or not, as far as the United States is concerned. The United States just wants to make sure it has access to that critical mineral. 
but yeah, my opinion, as I'm sure, you know, is the um, is the experience of a lot of people on on this uh, symposium is that uh, state-owned enterprises tend to be less effective. They tend to suffer from problems in terms of financing, profitability, and the tech that they have access to, as well as the human capital. And that's going to be a real challenge in in Mexico. Um, you know, add into that the water challenges that we see in the state of Sonora, extremely arid state facing you know increasing desertification and you know the fact that it recently in mexico we've seen water politics playing a very very high profile role uh in national politics and in the bilateral relationship you just go back a, a couple of years and constellation brands a u.s brewing company was forced to cancel a one billion dollar brewery project in the northern mexican city of mexicali uh because the new then new Mexican federal government said that uh, they shouldn't ever have been given the permits to produce there. Um, I suspect that Mexican lithium production will be marginal uh, for the near future, um, just because it's probably not going to work exceptionally well in the case of that resource. Now, the Chinese are investing in that. Um, yeah, the Mexican government is going to work very closely with that Chinese investor. I could be wrong. But what I see is that, honestly, throughout the region, the nationalization of resources, of critical minerals resources, is an important tendency, a trend that we should be aware of. We're seeing governments become increasingly uh, interested, not just in uh, monetizing the, uh, the resources, but in making sure that they have full control over them for geopolitical purposes. You know, just uh, a very, very interesting article that I would urge people to read from the, the most recent Wilson Quarterly on the US relationship uh, with the Democratic Republic of the, uh, of the Congo. Um, you know, the, the DRC is, is reevaluating its relationship with the Chinese because they realize that it hasn't been nearly as beneficial as they would like and the Chinese have really used it as a lever, a political lever over the government of the D DRC. I think we're, we're about to see a lot of that. I think we're gonna see uh, a playing off of Chinese versus US interests you know, as, and, and this will increase as we see decoupling taking place between the US and the Chinese economies. Um, there are opportunities to be had there for uh, companies and for countries in uh, seeking to maximize their benefits they can get. Something similar to what we saw in the original Cold War in the competition between the Soviet Union and the United States. I think that's coming up in the, in the very near future. But do you think in terms of, you know, the, the trend of nationalization, do you think it can, it's, it's something that can survive uh, in terms of the quality of the products? <coughs> Sorry, getting a bit emotional here. Um, <coughs> um, yes, you can see a nationalization of the resource, but it's how you approach the actual exploitation of the resource. And so that's what's important about the Mexican case. Um, you know, in Mexico, all subsoil resources actually belong to the state anyway. So this piece of political theater that we recently saw in the country, which was about nationalizing lithium, the lithium was already nationalized. It was already owned by the state. Um, if by nationalization, they mean that they're nationalizing the entire value chain, as used to be the case with the oil and gas industry, <coughs> then that's problematical because they won't be able to maximize the benefits and the value from those resources. If, however, they just say, we own it, so we want to be paid royalties and taxes, then that's fine. We can certainly work with that because that's what we do in a lot of countries anyway. Um, but I suspect that, you know, just given what I know about the current Mexican administration, they're looking at setting up a state-owned enterprise to exploit that resource. Thank you for that, Duncan. Um, so you know, in, in Canada, and there might be a similar situation in the US as well, there are several um, early stage projects for critical minerals like lithium, for instance. But analysts do say that you know, by the time a number of these projects come online, they might end up supplying to an overburdened market. Do you foresee something like this happening in, in you know, 2030, 2035, uh, since so many companies are entering the critical minerals hunt? So, Listen, I, I think that lithium is a very uh, interesting case. Um, we've known for many, many years that there's a lot of lithium out there in the world. It's not one of the most abundant minerals. The question is, you know, can you get the resource, access to the resource that is going to be 
you know, cost competitive, is going to have the right level of quality, purity, etc. Um, and so, uh, if you if you look at that, you say there's going to be there's going to be competition between different resources for all of those factors, including, of course, ESG standards. Because if you don't satisfy the environmental, social, and governance uh, uh, standards, then you're going to have a tough time getting the financing that you need. This is one of the biggest things that people forget about when we talk about uh, reshoring, nearshoring, ally shoring, um, is that you know, a country like Canada, Australia, the United States, they have huge advantages in, on the ESG front. And yes, I mean, you know, reshoring means that there is more of an environmental cost taking place in our backyard, but the overall environmental impact is probably going to be less just simply because the standards are higher. The second part of the equation is this. Demand is going to remain very, very strong for lithium. Um, the IEA uh, you know, recently published a, a study back in 2019 where they predicted, uh, sorry, 2020, where they predicted that by 2040, demand for lithium will be 42 times what it was in 2020. So over the next two decades, uh, a 42 times growth in demand for lithium. That means that we're going to see um, yeah, huge demand and, and whether or not you can get enough mines going in that time uh, or extractive processes in general to actually make that, to satisfy that demand is another question. And particularly when we throw in that initial factor that I mentioned, which is you know, the quality, cost, location, ESG standards. Beyond 2040, we enter into a, a different kind of equation, which is that recycling efforts, um, you know, the, 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 the EV industry in particular is saying, we want to be able to recycle as much of our uh, EV batteries as we possibly can. Let's see how that works out. We're not good at that at this point in time. But if we are to make that work, we need to have enough lithium as well as other critical minerals actually in the system for them to be able to be recycled when that time comes. And that's going to require a Herculean effort on the part of policymakers, not just at the federal level, but at the state and local level as well to make sure that it happens. And the, and the corporate interests, in particular, the GMs, the Fords, et cetera, need to be involved in that process as well. Excellent. Right. That, guys, fantastic conversation. We are unfortunately up against the clock. Let's at least get one in from the audience. We have a lot of audience engagement on this, Duncan. Speaks to the quality of the conversation you and Namel are having. I think, Namel, the one from uh, Frank, who is the executive chairman of the African Think Tank Minerals African Development. He's uh, Duncan, he's asking about what the implications are specifically to Africa with this need to secure. I mean, <clears throat> you touched a little bit about China and Congo and how that's going on. Could you press down a little bit more? Um, what yeah. this could be for the uh, African economy? Yeah, so I mean, from the point of view of the of the US government, uh, there is a recognition now that there is an urgent need to engage with producers of critical minerals wherever they may be in the world. Um, from the point of view of the investors, there's a uh, greater skepticism in terms of whether or not uh, ESG standards are going to be respected. And so, you know, there's, I think... We're in a situation right now where it's in the interest of the U.S. government to begin a global conversation on ESG standards around the world for the extractive industries. Yeah, we have EIT, EITI. We have the ERGI initiative here in the United States. We need to see a process where we begin to pull that together. Because if we can get to a point where we have a, uh, a harmonized approach to ESG across the world and we're able to secure compliance then we're able to, we'll be able to get the financing that we need to make these things happen, as well as satisfying the demand that we're going to see. So I think that's where, um, you know, African nations, um, the African Union may play a very, very important role in talking about how you actually make that a reality. And, you know, we'd be delighted to have some of those conversations at the, uh, at the Wilson Center. Fantastic. All right. And Frank did provide a, a link. So maybe we can get that over to Duncan and they can see if they're great. Thank you. There. Fabulous. All right, gentlemen, we are going to have to leave it there. What an excellent talk. Thank you very much, Namel. Thank you very much, Duncan. Lots of food for thought here and it'd be great to have you back at some other point, Duncan, to continue this. We'd love to. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you, Thank you Duncan. Thank you, Anthony. Thanks, Namel. Excellent.